Today we are starting a new series focused on the life and work of Disney artist and Imagineer Herb Ryman. Who was Herb Ryman? The most famous piece of artwork ever produced for Imagineering, the first unified bird's eye illustration of Disneyland, well, that was Herb Ryman. The person who created concept art for dozens of areas at Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Disneyland Paris, that was Herb Ryman. One of the people who traveled with Walt to Brazil and Argentina to create concept art that would be used for Disney shorts and two Goodwill animated features in the 1940s, that was Herb Ryman. An art director on classic films such as Dumbo and Fantasia, a sketch artist at MGM and Fox, one of the few artists who attended holiday parties at the home of the Disneys, and an artist who, for most of his life, saw himself as a fine artist rather than a studio artist. That, too, was Herb Ryman. He was one of the few artists to not only develop a friendship with Walt Disney outside of the studio, he was one of the few artists who influenced how Disneyland was developed, creating a park far more like a studio backlot than the type of park that had initially interested Walt. Last summer, here on the podcast, we looked at the early life of Dick Nunes in eight episodes. And then last winter and spring, we looked at the lives of the Sherman brothers in 12 episodes. And now we're jumping into the life of one of the key artists for Walt Disney, both for film and at Imagineering. I first started work on this project back in 2018. That's how long it takes to pull these things together. Some of the research, such as for this series, involves travel to archives, special collections, and to interview people in person. So before we get started, I want to thank all of our Bandcamp subscribers for making projects like this possible. None of this could move forward without their support. And I would also like to thank some new subscribers by name and welcome them to our Bandcamp group. In particular, I would like to thank Michael, Kevin Y, R.T. Purr, Jack Zero, Stephen C, Matt M, A and K, OK529, Gumdrop, David and Disney Girl. Thanks again to each of you and to everyone over on Bandcamp. And now let's move down into the world of Herb Ryman, an artist who will have a tremendous effect on the world of the Disney studio and Imagineering in particular, and an artist who also was ultimately changed by Walt Disney. <laughs> As a fine artist, Herb Ryman's paintings were exhibited in galleries around the world. As an art director and sketch artist, his visions shaped dozens of movies including David Copperfield, A Tale of Two Cities, Anna Karenina, and Mutiny on the Bounty. At the end of his life, however, he would be best known for a single drawing he made over one weekend, a drawing that he would later say wasn't particularly good. To some, he explained his wish to redo it, as it didn't represent his best work. It was a drawing that, in ways, changed the world. The first unified drawing of Disneyland in which the lands and attractions were arranged on a single piece of paper. In 1953, as Walt Disney was raising money to build his amusement park, he needed a showpiece illustration so bankers would understand his vision. Walt asked Ryman to create this drawing, an assignment he almost turned down. But as Ryman explored the concept of Disneyland, he understood that this park in ways was a visual representation of his own life, a pulling together of key experiences. As a young man, he had worked for MGM as an artist who sketched out sets that were constructed on stages and in the back lot. As an individual artist, he had spent just over a year touring Asia and Europe, trying to capture the world around him with drawings and watercolors. 
Walt was not only asking him to unify designs for various lands into a single drawing of an amusement park, he was asking Ryman to draw upon all the things he had experienced overseas, all of the films he had worked on at MGM and Fox, and the way that he as a boy had wanted to find something more exciting than what was offered in the small cities around him. Walt was asking Ryman to create a large drawing that would present the wonders of the world of Africa, Asia, storybook Europe, and the Old West in a way that people who saw this drawing would ache to visit this new type of park in the same way that Ryman himself once ached to tour the world. On that weekend, the fourth weekend of September, Ryman sat down with Walt Disney, a man with whom he had had a long and complex relationship, and sketched out the first unified illustration of Disneyland. Herb Ryman, or Herbie as he was known by friends, was born on June 28, 1910, in Vernon, Illinois. He was a small boy with curious eyes and narrow ears, a boy with a long face that made him appear at times as though he were faintly related to elves. He was a distant descendant of Charles Dickens, the British author who had penned A Christmas Carol and A Tale of Two Cities, among other books. And some of that great author's yearnings, the dream of finding an audience through art and story, moved through Herbie even when he was young. At his birth, neither of his parents sensed his future ambitions. He was named instead after his father, Herbert Sr., a man who, though gifted as an illustrator, worked as a teacher and later as a doctor, happily putting aside his artistic ability to support his family. Ryman spent his early years far from Hollywood and far from American centers of art. I was born in a tiny little town, he said. There wasn't a hill. There was nothing. There weren't even any big trees. There were just 20-foot rows of corn. Even as a young boy, he felt a force inside of him, luring him away from the Midwest to other parts of the world. I wanted to see palm trees. I wanted to see volcanoes. I wanted to see elephants and tigers. I wanted to see everything that was in the National Geographic. But he experienced nothing like this when he was young. His family moved from one small town to the next, from Vernon to Pulaski, not far from where the Mississippi and Ohio rivers meet. There he lived in a small house along with his parents and two sisters, both of whom were older. His mother came from a family of ministers and teachers. Before she had children, she had been a high school teacher in Shawnee, Kansas. His father, too, had started as a teacher, also in Shawnee, before studying medicine at the Kansas State Medical College in Lawrence, an education that gave him an important position in the community, but never much money. While living in Pulaski, his father was the town doctor, and aside from his work as a general practitioner, he was involved in community projects that helped start a local chapter of the Red Cross. My parents were poor, Ryman said. Father was a wonderful country doctor. At one time, Herbie's father, Herbert Sr., had been interested in art and had an eye for accurately presenting the human form, a skill that he had used to create medical illustrations of human muscle and organ structures. His renderings and anatomical drawings won prizes, Ryman explained. It was his father who first introduced him to the world of drawing and painting, which for him was now little more than a hobby. 
Even as a young child, Herbie was interested in drawing, sketching, and coloring. He was a small child, often frail and sick. Most years he spent weeks in bed suffering through a cold or the flu. Every spring or every winter I'd have some illness, he said. I don't know why, but these illnesses were practically to the point of death. And during the childhood illnesses, you can't read, you can't use your eyes, so I would dream about pictures. When he was well, he loved to read Tarzan novels and paid particular attention to illustrations done by J. Allen St. John. He loved newspaper comics. Among his favorite were the Cats and Jammer Kids and Old Doc Yak, a strip featuring a talking goat. His mother was able to provide him with piano lessons, which he also enjoyed, but he was mostly taken with drawing. At school, he was good in English, but he struggled with math. Everyone could see that Herbie, even as a young boy, was being seduced by drawing, even though his family didn't have the means to support a child interested in the arts. But these concerns would quickly be put aside as the relatively easy time of the mid-1910s came to an end. In 1917 and 1918, the Ryman family faced twin dangers. Herbie's father was called to the war effort in France, where he worked as a battlefield surgeon, and in the United States, the Spanish flu moved across the country, killing thousands. Herbie was able to escape the pandemic largely by staying at home. But in terms of the war, his father was not so lucky. In 1917, Herbert Sr. enlisted as a first lieutenant in the Medical Reserve Corps, then trained for service at Fort Harrison before being ordered to Georgia as part of the National Guard. One year later, in May 1918, he was sent to France, where he served as a field surgeon. While overseas, he sent his son, then eight years old, trinkets of his army life, a pen and a knife, Finally, a bullet, a tactile reminder of the dangers around him. In September, he was hit with shell fire while dressing the wounds of an injured soldier. Initially, he was listed as wounded severely. Hearing the news, his three children wrote him letters expressing their love and sorrow and wishing that he would return home quickly. But those letters would never reach him. He survived the blast by only a few hours, and even while injured, he attempted to carry other servicemen off the battlefield. When they took off his boots, Herbie was later told, they were filled with blood. But this report took days to reach the Ryman family in Illinois, during which time the family prayed for his recovery, even though his body was already cold. Herbert Ryman Sr. was buried in France near the field hospital, the grave marked with a regulation cross inscribed with his name. The news was an unexpected blow to the family, one that they did not know how to absorb, especially as for days they had believed him to be alive and recovering. They planned a memorial service at the local high school, but due to a resurgence of the Spanish flu, these plans were delayed for weeks until the threat of contagion had gone down. Herbert Sr. was the first person from Logan County, Illinois, to die in the conflict. He would posthumously receive the Distinguished Service Cross for heroism during battle. The award was presented to his widow, Cora Bell Ryman. Initially, the family believed that they would be supported by his life insurance policy. But in very fine print on the bottom, Herbie explained, it said in case of war or act of God, this policy is null and void, so our destiny was to try to live on $57.50 a month. In this, Herbie felt a sense of being abandoned by the structures and community that were supposed to protect him. At times he felt frustration, even anger, to his young mind. It was inexplicable how a person could be alive and well, sending letters and gifts, and then, a few days later, be wiped away from the earth. 
Herbie wanted to continue in that former world, the one where he knew that his father, though presently away, would return home someday, that he would see him again there in their small house. During the summer of 1919, Cora, now a single parent, explored her options. Though her husband had taken out a life insurance policy, she could not collect as his death was attributed to the war. She was left with a war widow's pension, a sum too small to support her and her three children. She knew she needed to work. As was her habit throughout life, she drew upon past experience in making this decision. I found myself confronted with the problem of providing for myself and three children, she explained. Naturally, I turned to that calling for which I had made the most preparation and for which I felt myself most fitted. As she had previously worked as a teacher, she decided to return to the profession hoping that recommendations from former employers and family connections, as she had many relatives who were teachers, would help her find a position somewhere in the state of Illinois. Within weeks, she had job offers, including one in Decatur, Illinois, teaching at the Durfee Elementary School. She chose Decatur specifically so that her children particularly her daughters who would soon finish high school, would have an opportunity to attend a local college. Without a father, education would be the key to their future. That September, the Ryman children said goodbye to their friends in Pulaski and followed their mother north, where she found a house only a few blocks from the college, a college the oldest Ryman child, Christine, would soon attend. For Herbie, Decatur was a new experience. His family was now in a city far larger than any he had known. They lived in a house on West Riverview, which was in the center of town, though to afford it, the family rented out an extra room to a boarder. Herbie was still a small boy, prone to illness, though now when he was home, he was often home alone. He spent his time drawing. I would copy the funny papers and I'd copy things that I liked, he said. With only a teacher's income and some military benefits, the family didn't have much money. But his mother was indulgent with her son's interests. She bought him India ink and little pens with the hope that drawing might somehow make up for all those afternoons when, due to illness, he was unable to play baseball or football with the other kids in their town. Herbie drew at his desk, at the table, but also in his bed, penciling out figures and then inking in the lines. Of course the quilts on my bed were ruined because the India ink bottle always spilled, but my mother was tolerant. He spent hours drawing, particularly on the rainy days and in the winter time when he was sick. He developed a belief that even though he lived in a small Illinois town, he would teach himself to draw lovely things that existed far from home. I used to think that I could get everything out of books. I could either trace it or copy it or project it, or I could get a horse or a cow or a bird or an eagle or an oak tree or a palm tree, girls on the beach or a hippopotamus. I thought it was all in the National Geographic. When he was well, he drew with other kids in town. We'd draw Mud and Jeff, or we'd draw some of the little comic characters. As they compared drawings, Herbie noticed that his were more exact and more expressive than those created by his friends, which gave him something he needed, a sense of confidence. I can't run fastest around the block, he said. I can't play basketball, and I'd strike out in baseball but I can do this. As he grew older, he pictured the world beyond Decatur more often, not simply for the images he might find there, but for the support it would give him. He imagined a world filled with interesting people in the arts and other fields, a world that would somehow sustain him more than the one presently around him. As a child, I knew there were oceans, mountains, big rivers, and other mighty elements of nature that I wanted to see. He also sensed that there were communities where most people didn't primarily focus on their next paycheck. 
By the time Herbie was 12, his mother was finding a larger success in the school system. She was a strong person who quickly moved from teaching to administration, positions that gave her more authority and money. In August 1922, after a Democratic candidate withdrew from a local election, she ran as a replacement to be county superintendent of schools. In that November's election, she would be the only woman running for any seat on the Macon County ballot, just two years after women were first given the right to vote. As Decatur tended to lean heavily toward Republican candidates, most in town believed that she would lose. But Cora pushed aside these concerns and focused on her campaign. She met people in town to discuss her candidacy. In some cases, she visited voters in their homes. She ran on her experience in the school system 12 years in total, including those years before her children were born. She pointed to her volunteer work with the church, teaching Sunday school as an example of her moral character. My experience, she told interested voters, has been in all the grades in both the country and city schools. Lastly, she described herself as a war widow whose husband had made the ultimate sacrifice on the battlefield. In November, Republicans were successful in winning every seat in the county except one. Cora was the lone Democrat selected for a county seat in 1922. The race wasn't even particularly close. With just over 18,000 people voting in the county, she won by 899 votes. As Herbie moved through high school, his family saw that he was interested and gifted in those subjects that would never bring him much money or lead to a traditional career. His mother talked to him repeatedly about following in his father's footsteps, becoming a doctor and a surgeon, perhaps using his artistic ability to create anatomy illustrations published in medical books. Just as she had followed in the footsteps of her family to become a teacher, Herbie might do the same to become a doctor. His mother's comments were echoed by his friends and teachers. Though Herbie's sisters were allowed to pursue interest in drama and cooking, Herbie, as a man, needed to have a financially reliable career. But Herbie, perhaps still touched with the genetic influence of his distant great-uncle, Charles Dickens, wasn't moving away from the arts. He was moving deeper into them. In high school, he acted in the drama club. In his junior year, the local paper singled out his performance in the 12-pound look as particularly noteworthy. The acting of Herbert Ryman in the role of Butler was excellent, a critic noted. He joined the yearbook, the poster club, and junior art league, pretty much any organization that would allow him to draw or paint. In high school, he won multiple art contests, including one that placed his work in competition with entries from students across central Illinois. His friends admired him, but by the time he was a senior, they joined in with his mother, urging Herbie toward other professions. You must do anything but become an artist, his friends told him. This has no future. He graduated from Decatur High School in 1927. But the following September, he didn't go to art school as he once hoped. Instead, just like his older sisters, he went to Millican University, a regional college that was only a 10-minute walk from his home. Once there, he could feel the claustrophobia of a traditional career coming down around him, a set of classes that he struggled to understand. Millican wasn't a school that gave people a path to an interesting life. It was a school that gave students a path to a reliable job. He worked as best he could through the first semester. But then during winter, he felt another illness come on something that he hadn't experienced in a couple of years. A hot pain like tiny embers inside his throat, then swelling around his glands. For Herbie, these signs were easy to recognize. The swelling was followed by a fever, which was followed by a haziness in his mind. 
It was his old nemesis, only this time it hit him harder than had earlier illnesses. Doctors explained that a virulent bacterial infection had progressed into scarlet fever. Ryman developed bumps on his neck, back, and stomach. A rash spread over his body. He was sick for weeks, at times delirious with a high fever. Though now a young man, he was at times sicker than he had been as a child. Day after day, he stayed in bed, his head resting on a pillow damp with sweat. For days, Cora watched Scarlet Fever drag her son toward death, his temperature rising at 1.2, 106. And as it did, she thought about all the times she had pushed him toward a career in medicine, a career for which he had shown no interest. At one point, the family doctor believed that Herbie would likely pass within a day. But even then, in bed with a fever, at times he thought about art. In my delirium, Herbie said, I expressed a desire to go to the Chicago Art Institute. My dear mother promised that if I recovered, she would try to see that I could go to the Chicago Art Institute. In this, the disease was both his enemy and his friend. It created the moment that finally gave him freedom. Herbie recovered slowly, and once he was well enough, he returned to the local college. But the experience was different now. He was free of family pressure to become a doctor or to pursue some other traditional career. He could finally focus on classes that inspired him. At school, he grew interested in serious artists, Goya, Constable Turner, and Velasquez. His mentor was an art instructor named George Rabb, who, in addition to teaching at Millican, was also the director of the Decatur Art Institute. Beyond the classroom, Rabb became a model for what Ryman hoped to achieve in his own life. A man whose interest in art elevated him beyond the workaday community around him. Ram told him to choose colors carefully, to manage the canvas, to let his work reveal the nature of the subject he painted. Rab had spent five years in Europe traveling, painting, and exploring art before he returned to the States to exhibit his work. My inspiration was George A. Rabb, Professor Rabb, Ryman said. I wanted to be an artist, and I was very early taught by Rabb the respect and integrity of what I was setting out to do. By the end of the year, Herbie's studies were almost wholly focused on art, and in the fall he planned to transfer to the Chicago Art Institute. Even though his mother had promised to let him pursue art, she still needed to be convinced that Herbie, her youngest and most fragile child, would be able to successfully live away from home. In this, Herbie knew that his own voice might not be enough to convince his mother. For assistance, he looked to his art teacher, a man slightly older than his mother. Eventually, Professor Rabb was able to persuade Cora that not only would Herbie be fine in Chicago, he would be in a situation that ideally would allow him to thrive. With this, Ryman believed that his future was set. My mother had enough faith in me, Herbie said, and in Rabb's confidence in me to send me to Chicago at the tender age of 19. But Cora still harbored private doubts, believing that her son might end up a penniless artist. Speaking confidentially to her daughters, she made them promise that they would forever be there to help their brother, as an artist surely could not survive merely on his art. Beyond his own future in art, Herbie's small rebellion had one other consequence. It inspired his sister Lucille, who was nearly four years older than him, to further explore her own interest in drama. Like Herbie, she too had been touched by the legacy of Charles Dickens. In college, she had studied acting and set design. The summer after college, she taught theater arts to children at Camp Kiwanis. 
But in the fall of 1926, she took a traditional job as a high school history instructor in the Decatur school system, more or less following in the footsteps of her mother. As Herbie focused his attention on studio art, she focused her attention on becoming a serious actress, though she kept her job at the school. She became involved in two local theater groups and worked with performing arts students. In this, Cora now found that two of her children, despite being guided toward reliable careers, were migrating toward artistic goals. Herbie, the youngest, wanted to be a painter. Lucille, the middle child, wanted to act on the stage. Beyond this, even Christine, the oldest, though now married, was interested in interior design and the culinary arts. In this, Cora, despite her best efforts, was the lone member of the family focused on a traditional career, one that would reliably support her and perhaps one or two of her children for years. She had risen from a teacher to an administrator and finally to county superintendent of schools. She now looked at her children, fearing what lay ahead and wondered about their futures. I'll be back next Sunday to continue our story about Disney artist Herb Ryman. On Bandcamp, you'll also find new material added this past week to our audio guide for Walt Disney World. And if you're interested in this story about Herb Ryman, how an artist from Illinois made his way to Hollywood and then to the Disney studio, there's another series on Bandcamp that tells the story of a different Disney artist, Dick Humor. Herb Ryman, as we'll discuss in the weeks ahead, comes to the Disney studio through the world of live-action film production, but Dick Humor comes to the Disney studio through the early animation studios. The story of his life, arranged into an album with six episodes, is on Bandcamp. I've repositioned it towards the top of the listing so that it's easy to find. If you want to join our Bandcamp group to support this podcast, you can do so by visiting our Bandcamp site. On Bandcamp, you'll find over a hundred episodes not available on iTunes. But the best reason to join is to support the work we do here. You can become a monthly Bandcamp subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.